The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and we will wrap up the doctrine of kenosis tonight. Now, the true concept of kenosis uh, goes as follows. First of all, during the first advent, Jesus Christ was both undiminished deity. That means he did not take away any aspect of his deity, whether it be absolute or relative. So he was a true God and true humanity, in one person and this is the concept of kenosis in that his humanity could not cross into his divine essence and neither did his deity cross over into his humanity so point one during the first advent that is when our Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth as the God man Jesus Christ was both undiminished deity and true humanity in one person. This is also known as the hypostatic union and we have cards on that that you can look at. Point two, therefore as undiminished deity and it's undiminished deity because uh, Jesus Christ uh, willfully on his own volition uh, re, uh, limited what he could do with deity but he did it with his volition. He could have chose to use it but he chose not to because it would have been outside of God the Father's plan. So as undiminished deity, Christ did not surrender his divine attributes, nor did he empty his deity. It would be, as I said, just as if uh, you had a personality of having a good sense of humor, and suddenly uh, you took that aspect out of your personality, it would change your personality. So deity was not changed. Deity cannot be changed. Jesus Christ was deity in his humanity, in hypostatic union, and none of it was uh, purposely withheld by God the Father. Jesus Christ pur purposely and willfully, on his own volition, withheld uh, some of the power he could have used from deity. <clears throat> and therefore, uh, uh, some people... Uh, come up with some fallacious stories such as when uh, Jesus was a teenager or when Jesus was a young fellow that he would uh, suddenly just turn a bird into something else and have fun with his friends by doing so but he never did that he never used his deity or the power of his deity he always utilized the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit the same power we have except God the Holy Spirit doesn't give us the gift of miracles. God the Holy Spirit gives us different gifts, such as the gift of pastor-teacher or the gift of helps. And you might have the gift of helps in which you are able to go to a hospital and comfort those who are sick. Or you might have a gift of administration in which you can help the pastor uh, put uh, the messages on the Internet or uh, make the CDs for it. That would be administration. And all the gifts are important, uh, but we do not today have the gift of healing, nor do we have the gift of tongues, or some of the other gifts that were prominent during those days because the canon of Scripture had not yet been completed. Point three, Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his relative attributes. Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his attributes relative attributes. He did so independently with his own volition, voluntarily, and this was so that he could be in compliance with the Father's plan 
for the incarnation or the hypostatic union. Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his relative attributes in compliance with the Father's plan for the incarnation. <clears throat> and this was the issue that came up in the wilderness. This was the issue in pretty much all of the temptations, especially the first temptation. In the first temptation in chapter 4, 1 through 4, 4 uh, or 4, 10, the temptation was that Christ from his deity would turn the stones into bread. But Christ didn't do so. Instead, he relied on the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and also the word of God that he knew. And in the same way, we would resist testing or past testing and resist temptation by using the same spiritual life our Lord lived. So he didn't use his deity to defeat Satan. He did it all from his humanity and all from the spiritual life the same spiritual life we have. And I keep emphasizing that because it's important for us to know that when we say to ourselves, what would Jesus do? This is actually what it means. This is what it has to do with, and it's uh, far deeper than just superficial. So Christ did not, uh, well, Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his relative attributes in compliance with the Father's plan. So he did this because God the Father had a plan for him to do that. This was the issue. And then point four, Christ did not use his divine attributes for his own glory. So he didn't go around impressing him, his friends uh, like on the, the movie where the guy has a beautiful fireworks show. I forget his name. In the Lord of the Rings, the guy uh, has this big fireworks show from his power. Gandalf, and Gandalf has all of this uh, great show to show everybody uh, with his own power as he comes into town. Well, Christ could have done that from deity, but he never did. He humbled himself. He didn't use his deity. He wasn't supposed to use his deity, so he followed God's plan. So he didn't do it for his own benefit. He didn't do it for his own glory. Christ did not use his divine attributes for his own glory. However... Christ did not give up his deity. He still had it. And while he was in the cradle, in fact, actually in the feeding trough, while our Lord Jesus Christ was laying in the feeding trough, he held the universe together from his deity because he is the creator of the universe. And he is also the one who sustains the universe. So the universe, while Jesus Christ was in the feeding trough as a baby from his deity, uh, was still being kept up and that's why we're still here today so he did not uh, he did not get rid of it he still had it but he didn't use it for his own glory he voluntarily surrendered the independent expression of his deity because if, if he would have used his deity in certain cases in the relative sense it would have hindered God the Father's plan, and he wouldn't have been able to go to the cross. Point five, to execute the Father's plan for the first advent, the first advent being the incarnation, the hypostatic union, to execute the Father's plan for the first advent, the humanity of Christ relied solely on the prototype spiritual life. He relied, relied solely on the two power options the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. So he used the same things we use. And he used eight problem-solving devices. We have ten, of course. And he used the three spiritual skills and the four spiritual mechanics. And if you're wondering what the three spiritual skills and four spiritual mechanics are, there's a, a little thing up there that uh, actually it's laying down and it deals with the whole entirety of the spiritual life all the way from the uh, three spiritual skills, two power options, four spiritual mechanics, ten problem-solving devices. It lays it out for us, and we will study it in detail, of course, uh, at the proper time. To ex so to execute the Father's plan for the first advent, the humanity of Christ relied solely on the prototype spiritual life, which included all the things I just noted. Point six, consequently, the independent expression of his deity 
and the independent exercise of his divine attributes was not, as scripture says, a gain to be seized and held. Again, the independent expression of his deity and the independent exercise of his divine attributes, such as keeping the universe in order while he was on the earth, was not a gain to be seized and held. In other words, he didn't look at it as something that could benefit him. He didn't look at it as a gain. He didn't look at it as, I have deity, therefore I'm superior to humanity. He was, but he didn't look at it that way. What he's saying is, it's not a gain that is to be seized or held. So the Father's plan for the first advent uh, must be executed with him independently uh, uh, not using uh, parts of his deity as per the relative attributes. Point seven. Therefore, Christ voluntarily took on himself the form of a servant in order to redeem man from sin. Christ voluntarily took on the form of a servant in order to redeem man from sin. Not only to redeem man from sin, but also to reconcile man to God. And we are reconciled. That means we are at peace with God the Father because of what our Lord Jesus Christ did. No other reason, not because of who and what we are, but because of who and what Christ was and what he did and is. And then the third one is to propitiate the Father. And propitiation means satisfaction of the Father. So here are the three again. He took on the form of a servant in order to redeem man from sin. Secondly, reconcile man to God. And thirdly, to propitiate God the Father. And propitiation means that God was satisfied by the work of Christ on the cross. And he was satisfied, and that was used in the Old Testament rituals when they would burn a lamb. And the uh, smoke from the burnt offering would go up as a fragrant aroma to God. And so it would be as if God were smelling the fragrant aroma of the lamb and be satisfied. Well, when our Lord was uh, bearing the sins of the world on the cross, that is what God was satisfied with. And he was propitiated, satisfied. The only way he could be satisfied, we cannot satisfy God on our own human personality, with our own good deeds, with our own ability. It was all Christ doing. And the eighth point, which is the last one uh, for this section, in fulfilling the mission of the first advent, in fulfilling the mission of the first advent, Jesus Christ did not exercise his divine attributes to benefit himself, to provide for himself, or to glorify himself. In fulfilling the mission of the first advent, Jesus Christ did not exercise his divine attributes to benefit himself. He didn't go around and half-heartedly just start uh, doing things uh, from his deity for his own benefit. He relied on the spiritual life, the same one we have. So he, he, his, uh, divine, he did not rely on his divine attributes to benefit himself, to provide for himself, as in turning the stones into bread. He could have turned the stones into bread and provided a very uh, good meal for himself. And in fact, being the Lord Jesus Christ, he could have provided himself a steak that tasted better than Outback's. He could have provided himself uh, with a very large potato with uh, melting butter all down the center. And it would have been tempting since he was starving after 40 days of not eating, but he didn't do it. He didn't do it because he did not use his deity to provide for himself. And that's what Satan was trying to get him to do, trying to get him to deviate from God the Father's plan and provide for himself rather than him relying on God the Father to provide for him. And that is, uh, and he passed that test. And then the third one, or to glorify himself. He never used deity to glorify himself. That's why scripture says he humbled himself. Now there are also factors of kenosis. And uh, you can write that as a uh, topic in your notes. The factors of kenosis. 
Kenosis again is K-E-N-O-S-I-S, -S, uh, derived from the Greek word kenao, which means to deprive. So the factors of kenosis. Point one, Christ gave up the outward appearance of God. Christ gave up the outward appearance of God. That's the Greek word schema. S-C-H-E-M-A. S-C-H-E-M-A. Christ gave up the outward appearance of God. All of this is found in Philippians chapter 2, 7. So you can write that verse down and look it up later if you go over your notes. Philippians 2, 7. The Greek word there is schema. And it means that Christ gave up the outward appearance of God. But he did not give up the essence of God, and that's morphe, M-O-R-P-H-E, morphe, M-O-R-P-H-E. He did not give up the essence of God. So he uh, gave up the outer appearance of God. And in fact, uh, Jesus Christ was 100% humanity. He was a flesh, just as you and I are flesh. The only difference is he did not possess an old sin nature because uh, uh, his uh, father was uh, God the Holy Spirit. In other words, God the Holy Spirit provided the conception. And then uh, and all of it uh, meant that he did so by removing the contaminated male chromosome, uh, which has the sin nature. Because in Adam all die. And that it doesn't say in Eve all die. That's why Jesus Christ could be born from Mary, because uh, the woman does not pass down the defected gene of the sin nature. The man does, and that's because the man uh, committed a sin of cognizance. When the man sinned in the garden, he knew exactly what he was doing. The woman was deceived. In fact, Scripture says she was utterly deceived. Now, she still sinned, but it was a sin of ignorance, and because it was a sin of ignorance, She's not the one who passes down the uh, faulty chromosomes which contain the old sin nature. Only Adam. So in Adam all die, not in Eve. And that's why Christ was born of Mary, who was a virgin, and uh, she was a virgin, so that the contaminated cells would not uh, be in Christ Jesus. And they weren't. So Christ uh, didn't have a sin nature, which means he was able not to sin. And that's a posse non pecari in the Latin. Able, posse, non, not, pecari, to sin. Posse non pecari, able not to sin in his humanity. Able not to sin. And that means that uh, he, he could have sinned, but he was able not to. Now, all of us don't have that ability. We, we uh, when we're filled with God, the Holy Spirit, we're able not to sin, but only for a time. And then the sin nature will tempt us in some way and we will succumb and sin and then we are sinners. And there's no way around that and uh, we just have to use 1 John 1, 9 as believers. Uh, and in his deity, however, in his humanity, able not to sin, posi non pecari in the Latin. And then in, uh, for in his deity, he is not able to sin. Deity cannot sin. A deity cannot even choose to sin. So in his deity, he is not able to sin, known posse pecari, not able to sin. So in his deity, not able to sin, in his humanity, able not to sin, yet he could have made the choice to sin, just as Adam was able not to sin. Adam had that ability not to eat of the fruit, but he chose to. So after that, then he became... a uh, able to sin all the time and would never be able not able to sin he would always have a sin nature and that's what occurred with Adam so in Adam all die but in Christ all shall be made alive so Christ voluntarily took upon himself the likeness of mankind that is found in Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 and that's point 2 Christ voluntarily took upon himself the likeness of mankind. He chose to do so voluntarily. In eternity past, there was a great conference in heaven between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father devised the plan. And God the Father said, look, there's going to be a human race that will fall, and this human race needs to have a Savior. 
And God the Father made a plan and said, uh, you, second member of the Trinity, uh, you will execute this plan. And uh, the second member of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, said, Yes, I will fulfill this. And it was already decided. And he voluntarily did it and said, Yes, I will take on the form of a man and I will die as a substitute for all the people in the world. And he made that choice in eternity past and fulfilled it. And then God the Holy Spirit is the revealer. And God the Father said, I have a plan you will reveal that plan to these lesser creatures called human beings. And that's why we have the filling of God the Holy Spirit who reveals to us this marvelous plan of God. So God the Father devised the plan, God the Son executed the plan, and God the Holy Spirit reveals the plan to the human race or to those who are positive and want to know it. So Christ voluntarily took upon himself the likeness of mankind Philippians 2, 7. Point 3. For this reason, he prayed for glorification of his true humanity. That's found in John 17, verse 5. For this reason, he prayed for the glorification of his true humanity. John 17, verse 5. And why did he pray this? Because he was praying that uh, he would go to the cross and all of this would be fulfilled. He would go to the cross and this would be fulfilled. So this prayer was a part of self-comfort for the humanity of Christ, knowing that he was going to do this. So he prayed to God the Father that, in fact, his humanity would be glorified. Right and During his uh, time on the earth, it was humiliated. For this reason, he prayed for glorification of his true humanity. Point four. <clears throat> Jesus Christ had not emptied his deity or his divine glory, but at that point, he had not yet achieved the strategic victory of the angelic conflict. What's the strategic victory? That's when Jesus Christ died as a substitute for us. And that's when he had a strategic victory over Satan. Jesus Christ had not emptied his deity. It was still there in his body. And he had not emptied his deity and he had not emptied his divine glory. But at that point, he had not yet achieved the strategic victory. So that's why he's praying for glorification of his humanity, because he had not yet achieved the strategic victory. But he would uh, when he went to the cross. Point five. In John 17, 5, Christ was praying for battlefield victory. The great battlefield for Christ against Satan was when he was on the cross. Now also, he was under evidence testing in Matthew chapter 4. But this was a skirmish. This wasn't the real war yet. The real, the real war came on the cross, and when all of our sins were being poured out on him and judged, it was excruciatingly painful for him, yet he was able to handle it and have a battlefield victory in his humanity using the same spiritual life we have, which is phenomenal. So he wasn't, he wasn't praying in John 17, 5. In John 17, 5, he wasn't praying for the restoration of divine glory. He wasn't going to God and saying, Hey, uh, give me my divine glory back so that I can play around with these people. No, he was saying, I pray for a victory on the battlefield. On the cross, I pray for victory. I pray that I will be able to impersonally love all of these people so that I can handle all of their sins and be able to have the happiness of God during those terrible three hours. So it had never been taken from him. He was simply praying for victory. That's point five. Now what we have from Kenosis, which is part of Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, is the sustaining ministry of God the Holy Spirit. The same sustaining ministry that sustains us in our times of need and in fact teaches us all things. So the ministry of God the Holy Spirit was given to the humanity of Christ just as it's been given to us. And the ministry of God the Holy Spirit as being a spirit filled was never given in the Old Testament. They did have endowment of the Spirit and uh, David in the Old Testament was endued with God the Holy Spirit, but he wasn't indwelled, neither was he uh, filled with God the Holy Spirit. So Isaiah was the uh, first prophet to prophesy that there would be a power system for our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And that power system has to do with the two power options, the filling of God the Holy Spirit and perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. Point one, Isaiah prophesied that a power system would come. He prophesied that God the Holy Spirit would indwell a human and fill the soul. And Jesus Christ, therefore, was the first one to receive the ministry of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. This is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. So Isaiah prophesied this power system that would come, that God the Holy Spirit would indwell a human and fill the soul. And Jesus Christ was the first one to receive this ministry. Isaiah 11, 1. A shoot will grow up out of Jesse's stump. This is Isaiah 11, 1. What's that mean? A shoot will grow up out of Jesse's stump stump. Well, a stump is, of course, a tree that has been cut down and left behind is a stump. Now, what was the tree that was cut down? Israel, by the fifth cycle of discipline, it will be chopped down in 70 AD. A shoot will grow up out of Jesse's stump. That is, uh, Israel was cut down by the fifth cycle of discipline. And a branch will sprout up from his roots and bear fruit. This has to do with the millennial reign of Christ. A branch will sprout up from his roots and bear fruit. And this is Israel under the millennial reign of Christ. And in the millennium, Christ will actually reign on the earth for 1,000 years. And there will be 1,000 years of perfect environment on the earth. If you're not familiar with uh, the, the dispensations, and I don't know if you were here or not, but I think we I have it on CD over here, 42 through 62. I might have got to dispensations by then. If not, we'll be making some more MP3s of all of the essentials and make them available in case you miss some of these things. And then 11 to the Spirit of the Lord, that is God the Holy Spirit as the power source, Isaiah 11 2. The Spirit of the Lord, God the Holy Spirit, as the power, will rest on him, Jesus Christ. So this is Isaiah prophesying the filling of God the Holy Spirit in connection with the hypostatic union of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of Wisdom. And the Spirit of Wisdom means that God the Holy Spirit teaches us Bible doctrine and also gives us the capability to apply the Word of God. And when we have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, we can apply the Word of God. We can apply such verses as 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares on the Lord, for He cares for you. But only in the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, can we apply these doctrines effectively. And understanding. So what Isaiah is prophesying is that God, the Holy Spirit, will not only allow you to apply doctrine, but also allow you to perceive doctrine. That's what understanding means, and understanding. And apart from the filling of God the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand spiritual matters. It would all be foolishness to us. So if you ever wonder why some people just never catch on to what the Word of God is all about, it's because they're not spirit-filled, and they, there's no way they can understand it unless they eventually come to grasp the fact that they must rebound and be filled with God the Holy Spirit. If they don't know that much, they won't know anything, really. The spirit of counsel, that is also God the Holy Spirit being uh, prophesied. And the spirit of counsel uh, means that uh, the God the Holy Spirit would give Jesus Christ the right word for every situation and every circumstance in his life. Because he was filled with God the Holy Spirit when he was challenged by Satan, he had a word <coughs> just like that. He knew exactly what he needed to say to a Jesus Christ. And we see this in 4.1. Then Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. After he fasted for 40 days, we all studied what that meant, and 40 nights, he was very hungry. And that's an understatement. He was starving. The one who constantly tempts, that would be a Satan continuing to tempt our Lord in the wilderness, came and said to him, Since you are the Son of God and you are, command these stones to become bread. This was his temptation to use his deity, but he did not. But he told him, Jesus told him, It stands written, 
Man shall not live for bread alone, but for every word that comes or proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he immediately had scripture that God the Holy Spirit brought to his memory. Remember, God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So while he's under this tremendous pressure and starving to death, all of a sudden God the Holy Spirit gives him this scripture, brings it to his memory so that he can shove it in the face of Satan. So this shows the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit, the same power we have. And if you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, uh, when you get in a bad situation, God the Holy Spirit will bring to your memory those things you've forgotten, such as a promise you may have forgotten, and you'll actually remember it and apply it to the situation. And uh, that is counsel. That's what it means, the spirit of counsel in 11.2, Isaiah 11.2, and power for his life uh, from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ would have power. Then it goes on to say, the spirit of knowledge. And the spirit of knowledge means that this uh, God, the Holy Spirit, is able to uh, give you maximum metabolized doctrine in your soul and as it was also given to our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, the spirit of knowledge is able to give us occupation with the Lord and occupation with the Lord. Then, uh, another prophecy concerning the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, for Jesus Christ is found in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, where it says, Here is my servant whom I sustain. And that is the sustaining ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. My chosen one in whom my soul delights, I will put my spirit on him. He will make just decrees for the nations. And that means Jesus Christ controls history. And also the just decree is that if you believe in Christ, you receive the righteousness of God. But uh, the fact is that there's a mention of all the nations means that Jesus Christ controls history. And that means uh, Jesus Christ can cause the rise or fall of nations. And if our country doesn't wake up to the importance of the word of God, he will cause our fall. Because in the Acts, it tells us very clearly and specifically that Jesus Christ determines the borders and the uh, lifetime of nations. And that's true for the dispensation of Israel just as much as it is true for this dispensation. And there's a nitwit out of Massachusetts. Of course, he would be from Massachusetts, a disgusting place, uh, where he says, well, there's no uh, fifth cycle of discipline. And he's studied under the colonel and knows better, but he thinks that uh, he knows more. That's what happens with a lot of pastors. They get arrogant and think they can go out on their own and make up something and say, oh, the fifth cycle of discipline is only for uh, the Israelites. No, it's not. Jesus Christ controls, controls history all the time. And our influence as believers is greater now than it was before. The idiot, don't get me started on that. So then we have Isaiah 42, 1. Here is my servant whom I sustain, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I will put my spirit on him. He will make just decrees for the nations. Then in Isaiah 61, 1. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has chosen me. He has commissioned me to encourage the poor, to help the brokenhearted, to decree the release of captives and the freeing of prisoners. Who are the prisoners? All of us as unbelievers are prisoners to the old sin nature. And until we believe in Christ, we do not break those chains. So all of this was prophesied. The fact that Jesus Christ would live under a power system, the same one we have, has been prophesied. So this ministry of God the Holy Spirit is also related to the virgin birth. That's found in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Excuse me. In Matthew chapter 1 verse 20, it talks about the immaculate conception of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is part of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit related to that. Christ was constantly filled with God the Holy Spirit from birth. That's found in John chapter 3, 34. In John chapter 3, 34, it talks about how Christ was filled with God the Holy Spirit from birth. John 3, 34. For the one whom the God has sent speaks the words of God. That means Bible doctrine. 
Jesus Christ spoke uh, Bible doctrine, and so does, uh, well, uh, God the Holy Spirit reveal it to us. For he does not give the Spirit sparingly. And this means that Jesus Christ was given the complete filling of God the Holy Spirit, and that's found in John 3.34. The filling of the Spirit is related, related to the baptism of Jesus, Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17, which we studied on Sunday concerning uh, the baptism of the Spirit and how the dove came down uh, during that time of his uh, baptism. And his baptism, remember, was related to the death and burial of our sins and then his resurrection. God the Holy Spirit's also related to his public ministry in Matthew 12, 18. We'll get to that. It's also related to the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit and it's related to the Holy Spirit's uh, ministry to Christ as it is uh, continued as an agent in resurrection. What do I mean by that? God the Holy Spirit was an agent in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he had the power of God the Holy Spirit resurrecting him from the dead. Guess what? We have the same power because all of us will be resurrected in the same manner all by the power of God the Holy Spirit. And if the resurrection were to occur today or tonight, uh, we would simply go into the presence of our Lord and that power would be God the Holy Spirit uh, transferring us from these bodies of corruption to our bodies of incorruption and immortality. And it would happen in the blink of an eye and we could be sitting here and then poof, uh, we're in the clouds with the Lord in the air and you won't be scared about heights either. You'll be worshiping him. And so uh, that is what occurs at the resurrection. If you die before the resurrection, uh, you will be uh, resurrected uh, from that dead body, wherever it is, whether it's cremated or not. There's no uh, real point. Uh, I know the Catholics want your body intact because they say, what about the resurrection? Well, God, God can uh, bring ashes up from the dead. That's ridiculous. Is God not God? Can he not do that? Of course he can't. And some people like there's ashes scattered all over the sea. Well, all of a sudden at the resurrection, up from the sea would uh, come the new body. Or if uh, I would like my ashes spread on Mount Mitchell probably, and up from Mount Mitchell would come me and I would be closer. <laughs> no. So the Holy Spirit's ministry to Christ is continued as the agent in resurrection, just as we have the same power that will transfer our bodies of corruption into the bodies of incorruptibility and immortality. So Matthew uh, chapter 4 verse 1 and we'll continue. That's the end of kenosis except a quick review right now. Then Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit then being chronological immediately after his baptism he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil and that is his evidence testing. After he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and during that time he was meditating on the word of God and both day and night he meditated on God's word and he was starving to death and the one who constantly tempts Satan came to him and said since you are the son of God and you are command these stones to become bread in other words give up your uh, deity or not give it up but use your deity to turn the stones into bread but uh, Christ didn't do so and instead from the power of God the Holy Spirit and from knowing the word of God Jesus Christ quoted scripture saying it stands written, man must not live for bread alone. Bread, a simple mere detail of life. But for every word that comes from the mouth of God. So he quoted scripture and, well, Satan uh, did not succeed. Jesus Christ used the unique spiritual life, the prototype spiritual life, using the two power options, the filling of God the Holy Spirit and application of the word of God. He followed the concept of kenosis depriving himself of the use of his deity in order to prove a point. And the point is, this spiritual life that we have been given to us works. That's the point. Now we go on to the uh, second test listed in chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that would be Jerusalem. Then the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point, the highest point of the temple complex, which would be about uh, 450 feet high. The highest point was a porch 
that was built by Herod the Great, 450 feet high off the ground, and it overlooked the valley of Kedron. And it was a very uh, beautiful view in which uh, Jesus Christ would be able to look out and uh, have a, a beautiful view of all the bustling people and all the buildings and all that uh, humanity had to offer. And then Satan said to him, this is a first class condition, which means, if you have if, it really means since, since you are the Son of God and you are, jump, for it stands written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up with their hands so that at any time, that's an addition, that's an addition to Scripture. That's not part of Old Testament Scripture. You see, Satan is quoting Old Testament Scripture. He will command his angels concerning you. Correct. They will lift you up with their hands. Correct. But then he adds an addition. So that at any time, just those few words Satan adds to Scripture, and he does the same thing today with invite Christ into your heart. An addition to Scripture. Not there but they preach it as if it's in the Bible. Not there. No one has ever shown it to me because it's not there. Or they make other additions. Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. All of which might do with a taboo, uh, but it has nothing to do with uh, what Scripture has to say. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up with their hands so that at any time... And as soon as he added that, well, Jesus knew that uh, he would have to come up with another scripture to counter him. You, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> you will not strike your foot against a stone. Now this temptation deals with uh, Jesus Christ's relationship to the Word of God. Is he going to know enough of the Word of God to handle this temptation? Or is he going to say, yeah, scripture does say that. I'll just jump and show this freak that the angels will grab me and lift me up. But uh, Jesus knew that he was adding some words because he knew Scripture. So if we're going to follow in the footsteps of Christ, we too need to learn Scripture. And that is how we do. What would Jesus do? He would learn Scripture and know it so that when the test came, he would be able to pass it. So this temptation deals with his relationship to the Word. The first temptation that we just studied dealt with his relationship to the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit and whether he would shift from God the Holy Spirit to using his deity, which he did not. The second test has to do with will he know enough of the Word of God to be able to uh, understand that Satan had just distorted Scripture, and of course he did. It, 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 it is actually a reference to his relationship with the word of God and did he know it and since Jesus resisted the uh, temptation to act independently of the indwelling of the spirit uh, and in the power of the word Satan attacks the source of this resistance the source of the resistance the source of the resistance is the word so Satan directly attacks the word of God and adds to it so that at any time that's his addition distorting the word by removing it from its original context, you see, he just pulls it out of context. Uh, here he, he, he just says, go ahead and jump. Well, that's out of context, and uh, you can't apply the Word of God out of context. It would be like saying, uh, God's always going to take care of me, so I'm going to walk out in the middle of the street and beg for a car to run over me. That's stupid. And uh, Satan was trying to get Jesus to be stupid, but he didn't do it. And if Christ would have jumped, and fell 450 feet, he would have died in his humanity. It would have killed him. Just as hanging on the cross, well, he eventually gave up his spirit on his own volition. But if he had uh, said, yeah, you're right, Satan, that's part of Scripture, I'm jumping, he would have hit the ground and died, and there would have been no cross, and that's exactly what Satan wanted to occur. So he distorted the word by removing it from its context and from its correct, correct interpretation and also added some words, which is what, if you think about it, that's a, what a lot of ignorant and arrogant believers do today. And they are led astray by additions to Scripture. And then in 4.7, Jesus pass, passes the test once again. Jesus replied to him, 
Once again, it stands written, do not tempt the Lord your God. Now, Jesus' quote of scripture actually applied to the situation because if he would have jumped off the uh, 450-foot porch and uh, fell, he would have been tempting the Lord, saying, uh, Lord, you will not kill me if I do this and jump off. And Lord, you'll save me. You're tempting the Lord. It would be just like uh, going outside in the thunderstorm we had earlier and holding up a nine iron. Well, you would be an idiot. You're tempting the Lord to strike you dead out there in the middle of a storm holding up a nine iron. Well, that's what Satan was telling Jesus to do, basically. Go ahead and jump. You'll be fine. God will protect you. Well, you've got to have common sense. And this is where the Lord said, Do not tempt the Lord your God. And this was a correct application of Scripture. So again, Jesus Christ passes the test. This time, he passes the second test. The second test is related to his relationship with the Word of God. Then we go on to the third test in chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their grandeur. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Now we have to understand something. Now you might think that is not a legitimate request. It is. Remember, Satan right now is the ruler of the world. This is the devil's world. And, in fact, uh, he was made the ruler of the world when Adam fell. We remember that from Genesis. So he's the ruler of the world, and in fact, he could say, I'll give you all of this world that I have if you just fall down and worship me. And that was the temptation for the Lord. And it was a temptation to Jesus... Jesus' uh, uh, obedience to the plan of God the Father. You see, the cross had to come before glorification. And by going ahead and taking all the world right then and there, by, by bowing down and worshiping Satan, what he would be doing is taking glory now, or at that time, rather than at the cross. So in dealing with this, uh, well, it would have been a promotion. He said, all right, humanity of Christ, I will make you ruler of the world. I'll give all of this that I have to you if you just fall down and worship me. This temptation was related to the obedience to the plan of God the Father. And it was the plan of the Father for Jesus to rule the world, of course. But the cross must precede the crown. And that's an important point. The cross, the suffering of the cross had to precede the, the crown of, of his humanity. Satan's offer was actually a bona fide offer. It actually was something he could have offered to him and gave to him because he is the ruler of the world and that's found in John chapter 12, 31. John chapter 12, 31 talks about how Satan is currently the ruler of the world. John chapter 14, verse 30 talks about how Satan is the ruler of the world. Also in John chapter 16, verse 11, John 12, 31, John 14, 30, and John 16, 11. Also in Ephesians chapter 2, 2, all of these deal with the rulership of Satan and the fact that he is the ruler of the world. Therefore, as the ruler of the world, he could offer Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the earth, a bona fide offer. And by doing so, uh, Jesus would naturally skip the cross. And that is what Satan wanted him to do, to skip the cross. All of these three temptations were designed to get him not to go to the cross. In the first one, he would have used deity, in which it would have destroyed his humanity. In the second one, he would have jumped and died, destroying his humanity, and he would be unable to go to the cross. And in the third one, well, we're here and we'll, we'll deal with that. So he must have the cross before the crown. So in dealing by application, in dealing with any promotion in your life, you must always wait upon the Lord. You are not promoted until God promotes you. Jesus Christ knew this very, very well. And he knew that his promotion to King of Kings and Lord of Lords as part of the strategic victory on the cross would not occur until the cross and until he suffered that great pain of the cross. So you are not promoted until God promotes you. And Satan's promotion 
He could have taken it, but it wouldn't have been God's promotion. And he did not take it. And if we are, and in, in fact, Satan's cosmic system, even for us, has its own promotion. That's why some leaders uh, go to prominence, such as Adolf Hitler. He functioned entirely and exclusively in Satan's system, the cosmic system. And he loved the cosmic system. And he was promoted in it all the way to be uh, the dictator of Germany, in which he conquered all of Europe. And then, of course, through anti-Semitism, was destroyed later. Jesus Christ, in this case, was definitely going to be completely obedient to the plan of God. So this test, the third test, had to deal with his uh, attention to the plan of God. Is he going to be obedient to the plan of God? And so the word of God has been attacked. Now the plan of God is being attacked. And at the first time, the power of plan of God was being attacked. The power system that Jesus used was being attacked. In 4.10, then Jesus said to him, it says, get behind me, Satan. Really what he said was, get out of here, Satan, for it stands written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. He failed in every way. He could not get Jesus Christ to move toward imperfection or to do anything even close to being imperfect. Could not get Christ to uh, divorce himself uh, from his humanity uh, and his spiritual life by using his deity. Could not get him to uh, fumble around in the word of God because he knew the word of God. So he couldn't get him to jump. And he could not get him to be disobedient to the plan of God. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and began ministering to his needs. Why the angels come and minister to the Son of God? Because he's in humanity, and humanity is lower than angels. So Jesus Christ actually humbled himself to be lower than the creatures he created, the angels. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 Verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. That's why he need ministering from the angels. And believe it or not, we receive ministering from the angels. We have guardian angels. And uh, there's a, a, a stupid sign that says, don't drive faster than your guardian angel can fly. But we do have guardian angels. And uh, we could never drive faster than that, so you can go as fast as you want, really. No, but not really. You have to do, do not tempt the Lord your God. But uh, what it's saying is uh, the angels actually serve us as ministers uh, right now. But that's because we are lower than the angels. But we sh see Jesus Christ, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So it was Jesus Christ who suffered death on the cross as a substitute for us and he was made a little lower than angels to do so which took humility on his part. And then in Hebrews 2.14 Since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity. Since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity. So right there we know that Jesus Christ was not some a form of a ghost or something that would uh, be superhuman. He actually came in flesh and blood just as we are flesh and blood. And he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. This indicates his humanity being flesh and blood. So we'll close up noting once again the three areas in which Jesus was tempted and tested in his evidence testing. Point one, Jesus was tempted to operate independently of the power of God, the Holy Spirit, by using his deity to turn stones into bread. Jesus Christ was tempted to operate independently of the power of God, of the power of God by, uh, and of the power of God, the Holy Spirit, by using his deity to turn stones into bread. Secondly, the second test, Jesus Christ was tempted 
in his relationship to the Word of God. Did he have the Word of God number one in his life and did he know it? Yes. So Jesus Christ was tempted in his relationship to the Word of God when he was tempted by Satan uh, by taking that scripture out of context. And then Christ used a verse of scripture with correct application, hence the importance of the Word of God. So by way of application for us, what would Jesus do? Learn and know the Word of God. Point three, this is the third temptation. He was tempted in regard to obedience to the Father's plan and following God's timing, waiting for God's promotion rather than Satan's promotion, and stepping outside of the will of God by, by taking the crown before enduring the cross. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study these testings of Christ. May we come to know that we have the same unique spiritual life so that any test that comes along in our lives, we can use the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and all of these things that we've been learning. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.